Hey Calvary, this is Patrick Sebecki here on the weekly podcast from Calvary. We're excited that you're listening with us this week. We're back again this week with Jake Bauer to talk about the exciting message that was given this last weekend at Calvary's campuses on Daniel 5. As always, if you need more information, go to calvarybible.com. You can click on your campus. You can click on events and see all the awesome things that Calvary is doing this summer around the Front Range. And with that, we're just excited to get into today's conversation. Jake, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. I, uh, yeah, I'm feeling awake and the smoke is starting to clear. So I think generally pretty good. Yeah, seriously. It was so gross over the weekend. Yeah. On Friday, I, uh, did my long run. I'm, I'm a runner and, um, I thought it was fog when I woke up and so, oh, as did so many people. Right. And so I ran a, a good couple hours in it and uh, was like, why do I feel awful today? Why do I feel so out of breath? And so, and alas, it was just breathing in smoke for multiple hours. Class. Oh, when yeah, we were number so three in the world for poor air quality. Did you know that? Oh my gosh. Number three. We were on Friday. We were number three on what? Like the national scope of air quality. That's like compared to like urban yes. cities that have millions of people. Like yes. we were number three. One of my students the other day was making the comment, and this won't be all we talk about today, but one of my students the other day was making the comment that he was like, why Why just us? Why the, these Canadian wildfires, they're really far away from us. Why is it just us that's getting I so I ha- also had that thought of just like, is Boulder just the perfect little valley nestled against the Rocky Mountains? There's like, got to be some scientific reason for it, right? Right. We have the National Atmospheric Research Lab here. We should just, if you, if you work for NOAA, can you just email us with the answer of why Boulder was so smoky? We would just really appreciate that. That would... That would make my soul rest easy. Like, this can't be, there's got to be a reason for this atmospherically. Yeah. This is just us recruiting the body of Christ to answer the questions we can't answer. <laughs> I, my, I, I'm always going to be curious how many times people really email you in response to email requests on the weekly. <laughs> it's a, that's a good question. <laughs> I'll let you know when it happens. Please do. <laughs> but. Anyway, so this week's sermon was on Daniel 5. We're nearing the end of the Winsome series that'll wrap up next week. Too soon, man. So oh, it's been so good. It really it really has been so good. It's like we're not even halfway through the book of Daniel, and I've loved it so much. Oh, alas, all good things, right? But uh, so we want to just talk about how that went. I think... This sermon particularly struck myself and a lot of other people. I think it's the most I've talked about a sermon on a Monday yeah. in a long time. Just to, It was just striking in how, at least at the Boulder campus, Tom went about it. And by report, Thomas at the Erie campus just went about this text in a really powerful and organic, but uh, in a way that it, it stuck with you walking away from it. So, Jake, what stuck out to you from Sunday? Yeah, I mean, I I was totally encapsulated in the story setup that uh, that Tom presented in Belshazzar. Um, I mean, we have this picture of, similarly to Nebuchadnezzar, this king who's sitting in this position and in this moment of security or of perceived security shall we say. Um, and he's they're, they're partying, and basically, I mean, the way that Tom described it was he said they are in a drunken orgy. Like that's what is happening in this scene um, with Belshazzar. And in the midst of this party of immorality and of drunkenness and of um, just absorbing pleasures, they decide to add to all of these things which are already sinful the direct defilement and abuse of the vessels of the temple. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't know. I, it just was such a, a picture for me of human wickedness, human rebellion, and human sin. That it, when you just read the passage as is without really diving into what's going on here, it's easy to miss the profanity of what's actually 
behind the lines here. Mm. Like it doesn't, it doesn't go into elaborate detail, but just by reading in between the lines, which I think is another thing that Tom said this weekend is if you read in between the lines of this, we, we're looking at a scene of absolute debauchery. Um, and to be honest, even as he was talking, I was thinking about our own culture and before, before he said anything Just else, even before he made the connection, yes. you were already there. Yes, totally. I was yeah. like, it seems like, and, and that's not even to say that we're in an especially bad cultural moment. I think there's different sins for different seasons and different timelines. But one thing I can say is at least in Boulder is that it, it is just starting to get to the point where, um, it seems to me like people have no categories for depth of sin. Like for, it, mm. it, you know, it's not even that they flipped the compass on its head and said that sinful things are good because that, that is what's happening. But it's even like, no, 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 let's take sin, which we no longer believe is bad, and let's make it as sinful as we possibly can. Let's, mm. like Satanism, let's talk about that and make that a part of our, our culture. Um, sexual immorality, like, well, you know, whatever, sleeping together before marriage, like we, we believe that's fine, but let's actually, let's take this to the next level and go into categories that are beyond, uh, anything that, that you might've imagined and talk about it openly or, or yeah. like, let's look at pornography and glory in that and not even talk about it as something that's and i think that's maybe our culture is awakening to that one a little bit in this mm. new era but there is some sense where i just remember even in high school people being unashamed about their um use of online pornography and and yeah. you're like wow i mean our culture is just diving in it so that's why i it just felt like the depth of this scene where mm. it's drunkenness and sexual immorality and then direct defilement and abuse of the lord's vessels seems like we're a little in line with the very heart of kind of just dive in as deep as possible. I don't know. What, yeah. what, what about that stuck sticks out to you? Yeah, I think, I mean, there's a lot to be able to go into there of just like how, yeah, just crazy. It's kind of become, and even like the stories I feel like I've been seeing more and more of, of even just, uh, Tina, my wife and I have been watching the third season of Ted Lasso mm -hmm. recently. And, there is a lot I really like about that show. I'm going to be honest. <laughs> and I don't know if I should really be saying that in a public way because there's a fair amount of cursing. But uh, I've just noticed even in this third season compared to the first two seasons, they are way more upfront about, I mean, even there was a character who came out as gay and then someone said, oh man, I don't even care about that. And then the main character gave this speech about how it's not enough to just not care, but we have to be supportive of it. And it was really funny because the main character is from Kansas and he made this equivalency of like, he had this one friend who was a Denver Broncos fan in the middle of chiefs country. And this poor kid was just so ashamed to be a Denver Broncos fan in the late nineties when wow. they were like winning. And he was like, and I should have, I shouldn't have just, not cared that he was a Denver Broncos fan. I should have supported him. And then one of the characters goes, did you just compare being a fan of the Denver Broncos to being gay? <laughs> and, just, and then another character just goes, what are the Denver Broncos? <laughs> Cause it's, it's a show about soccer players in England. <laughs> and it was just, Tina and I were just dying, but it was like this moment of like, okay, this story that I've, I've enjoyed a lot about was suddenly saying like, oh, it's not enough for us to just, like, not care that people are gay, which is, I think, how culture has talked about it, at least for the last few years. But now it's even shifting further to say, like, oh, you're actually wrong if you don't actively endorse and support someone who's living a lifestyle that, as Christians, we would say is sinful, is against God's design. It's like, whoa, that is just, it's just another step even to say, like, it doesn't, it doesn't matter how you feel about it. You have to endorse it yeah. now, which is, I mean, that's the, like the pulling of all this moment. I had the thought when Tom was describing how the 
Babylonian Empire has been taken over and really all that's left is the city of Babylon. It's like he throws this party because all his lords were there because it's the fortress. And I'm like, man, but if you're one of the lords who isn't on board with Belshazzar, like this king, it's like you just don't have a choice anymore because you're you're just stuck in the fort with them. Like, yeah. You just got to go with it. Yeah. I mean, this is like the end of Romans 1. one. They not only do those things, yeah. but give approval to those who practice them. Mm. And we would say <clears throat> today in our culture, that verse finds new meaning. Um, I, I think for for those in Boulder and beyond in this Colorado area, that one of, uh, you're, you're addressing it well, where the agenda is not just um, d- do these things, but it's, you need to actively, it, for you to say that these things are wrong, is for you to misalign yourselves with what's morally right. Yeah. Um, is that it, you not only have to it, it, have to be okay with them, but you also need to endorse them mm-hmm. as well. Yep. Yeah. Which, you know, it, 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 it's hard in in our culture to figure out how do we exist in that without looking like those who are just angry, mm-hmm. um, or those who are just upset. Uh, and and judgmental is is probably the entire way that our culture feels about um, people who do disagree with the agenda. Yeah. Um, but how do we exist like people in a culture that's saying, well, for you to even disagree with this or for you to even disapprove of this, even if you're not screaming my face, is for you to uh, be narrow-minded or bigoted. Um, yeah, even the like question of... Uh, have you have you seen the phrase silence is violence? Yes, I have. Yeah, I think that's been. I, I there was an article I read recently about how there was a pastor who just wasn't active on social media, and then was accused at a business meeting of being like all these terrible things because he hadn't signaled on his social media pages that he was the way this congregant wanted him to be. Wow. <laughs> it was just like, which was a moment for me who is not active on social media and my friends who are also in ministry who aren't active on social media because we just come to a conclusion that it's probably safer. It's probably wiser. And even for myself, I just think like there's a wisdom to me personally not being on social media for my own mental health. And then this moment of like, oh, a pastor who wasn't on social media was blasted purely for the reason that he wasn't on social media. It's no longer get blasted for what you say, but for what you don't. Yeah. Say. For what you aren't saying. Yeah. And there's, and there's an argument and within the midst of that, you know, you think about Martin Luther King's like, totally. If there's injustice anywhere, there's injustice everywhere in this sense mm. of, <clears throat> we need to speak up against injustice everywhere. But the problem is that the language of justice and the language of violence and safety are being applied to, dialogical disagreement into uh conversations and that's that's where i think we need to start standing up against that kind of thinking because mm. to say silence is violence and and i think it's am i right when i say that it's typically used in the context of race of crt and um it's i they were arguing across a variety of issues okay. in the article i was reading okay so it's a vaguer yeah phrase okay that's the context i saw used in and and, and, and in a sense of injustice, like to see someone being bullied and to not do anything about it, yes, that is uh, not the right approach, and we should stand up for those who are marginalized, who are the victims of injustice. But there is this idea where um, language is being equated to violence mm. rather than physical harm. And you and I have talked about this in the past, but I think that's where phrase like that when we start to associate opinions and ideas with violence and with uns- lack of safety that's where our culture can get a leg up and say well for you to not approve of our mm-hmm. actions and our lifestyles is actually unsafe or it makes me feel unsafe or it makes me feel like there's violence yep. um and, yeah. and we have to reject that we we have to because uh wh- number one it's not true like it's actually not causing someone physical violence to disagree with their actions, yep. um, 
or physical harm. And even if they argue from a mental health perspective, um, you know, that's, that's a different discussion, I think. But I think ultimately we should be able to disagree with people without causing them physical harm. Yeah. So as soon as that thinking makes its way into our brains, we go, uh, we get a charged scene where there just shouldn't be a charged scene. And what was a disagreement now becomes actually a moral issue of safety. Yeah. Oh, man, I think you and I have had so many of these good conversations because uh, we read a book together last summer, uh, The Coddling of the American Mind by um, Haidt and Lukianoff. And I think that's a really helpful book. Uh, since I'm wanting to keep us under time, I'm going to leave that conversation there. That makes sense. Because <laughs> we still should talk about Daniel 5. But Coddling of the American Mind has been a really helpful book for Jake and I in processing. How do we, how do we helpfully have conversations disagreeing with people in our culture? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we just are... So diving back into Daniel 5. Hi. My daughter and wife just came in. Just saying goodbye to them. Bye. Love you. <laughs> Next episode is going to be interviewing Beatrice oh, Sebecki. Yes, my my almost two-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> and her all of her thoughts on turtles. And it'll be great. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think... Even going back to Daniel 5, I think one of the things that continued to strike me about that passage was the way Daniel, so he's like in his 80s now, right? It's been 70 years since the exile. This is the turn at which, so the Persian Empire, unlike the Babylonians, had this like category for religious freedom. And so like we know that Cyrus, the guy who takes over, is going to let the exiles go back home. And Daniel, I don't know if Daniel knew that per se, but Daniel knew that the prophecies about Babylonians, yeah, that empire was coming to an end. And I just had a conversation with someone afterwards of like, it seems interesting that in a winsome series, Daniel just shows up and he's not even like, the way he was with Nebuchadnezzar was like, hey, I hope this is for your enemies and not for you because this is a bummer. Yeah, He just shows up and goes, yeah, you're done. <laughs> it's over, man. Yeah. And I just wondering like, how do we, how do we think about speaking in a way that reflects that, that level of truth, but also like, should we speak that way to the people we work with? It's a good question. I, and Tom makes the point too, that Daniel doesn't make the word. He, he, he preaches the word that is written mm. on the wall. Um, and you are right that he doesn't take a lot of time to say, man, may this interpretation be for your enemies and not for you. But I'm guessing Daniel was afraid because he knew the word was a harsh one. Um, and how do we present truth to a culture that rejects it? And that even in the action of presenting truth, we are now considered hostile um, um. and and harmful. And it's a good question. Uh you know, I, I, I think a couple things that come to my mind immediately is one is that our, our job isn't ultimately to convince people. Mm -hmm. um, that That is the work of God and the work of the Holy Spirit is that he's the one who opens hearts. He's the one who changes minds. And um, we can present the most faithful, truth-filled, loving thing to someone we disagree with, and they can reject it outright and call us jerks um and and so just a holistic reminder that our goal is not ultimately to convince the culture of our position but it is to faithfully make a defense when an opportunity presents itself um and so the the ultimate thing that i would like to tell people i would start with is start with what's missing in the culture rather than mm. correcting what's there um we we all know that no one stops sinning who is not uh, convinced of who Christ is. Like the the if we start with the sin issues in the culture and we start there and we start talking to people about 
Um, what they just should and shouldn't do. Totally. If we start there, then we actually create Pharisees if they obey us. Is totally. That they, they don't have the heart of Christ, but they do have the actions of a Christian and following the law imperfectly. They're not doing it well. Um, mm. And so we create Pharisees who are full of shame because they can't follow the law perfectly mm. and they judge others who don't. And that's mm. even just if they're convinced to follow the law, which today they're just not going to be because they're, they're totally doesn't appeal. Yeah. Um, so I would say start with actually what's missing in the culture. And that is like a crisis of identity. Um, who, who are we and what makes human beings valuable? Um, I think that that's what we're craving is what makes us valuable. What, what gives us um, value to other humans and w- what is the source of what makes injustice so unjust? It's the mistreatment of human beings. And why does that really matter? And we can give people a really compelling story and answer for that. Like we, you are valuable, yeah, valuable because you are created in the image of an almighty God who loves you and cares for you, and cares for you. And he created you to be in relationship with himself. And that's always true, no matter what, no matter who you are. And that's mm. an amazing message So start there. I don't know. What, what do you, what would you say? I mean, even that's like, that's why we're preparing an image of God series for the students in the fall Yeah, is like, because we've recognized as a student ministry team, like that crisis of identity is, is actually the primary issue that we're dealing with philosophically, theologically, like the place to go is like, what the heck is a human? Why, why were humans made and why are they valuable? Yeah. Because yeah, that question, if it's just, oh, humans, like everything else in the world, are a random accident, then it makes sense that people would shoot off in a million different directions trying to find the answer to that question. When in reality, there's a really sweet answer that God's given us in his word. And so I think I, I think that's so helpful, of even just like, man, what... Like, how are we going to talk to people? We're going to talk to people starting with the truth about the gospel, that they were created with value and God's working constantly to redeem them and save them and give them a new life in himself. Yeah, and you know, it's hard because we have to, we start by telling people the identities they've built aren't all there is because that's Mm. the language that's being used today is this is who I am. Yeah. Is my sexuality is who I am. And for you to infringe on that Mm. is actually not only just an offensive disagreement, but it is for you to deny the integrity of who I am. Um, And so we actually have to start even a little bit more backwards with the story of humanity before even making it personal of, you know, that's, that's one narrative is you are your sexuality or you are, your decisions um you are your desires that is one narrative we could be yeah. sold on totally it's the follow your heart it's the follow your heart narrative yeah it's every disney movie you can yes. think of yes. is your your desires and your feelings would never lie to you so you are who you want to be and yeah and that's and you can build that on your own you're you're independently able to build that yep. um but where does that identity piece fall short like where where does that story end and how how does it not satisfy? That's the first question we have to answer is mm. where does that identity story uh, fail to, to satisfy? And why is it that we have so many anxious and depressed people in our culture? Why, why is it that we have so many people who are lost? And there's a variety of reasons for that, but I really think one reason is that um, we're putting our identity in things that are fleeting and things that change is that, my, my feelings and my desires, if they define who I am and if they are the things that I, I see as fundamentally um, important to who I am, then I, I'm going to be so, I, like my desires change all the time. My desires are full of false notions and full of things that if I really follow that track and believe they're true, I'm just going to be shakable. Um, so I, 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 yeah, just one comment on that was that, that we really do have to start with identifying well what what is faulty about this identity piece that the gospel actually resolves yeah and i think it's notable that at the end of this like belshazzar he gets he gets rebuked he gets told his kingdom's coming to an end 
And at the end of it, he rewards Daniel. Mm. Like there's still this moment of like, he recognizes the truth of what Daniel's saying because of the way Daniel said it. And even the introduction of Daniel telling the story about Nebuchadnezzar, like before he even gets into it, he's like, the king's like, interpret the writing. And Daniel's like, well, let me tell you a story Yeah, about how I talked to your ancestor, Nebuchadnezzar, before he even gets to what Belshazzar has done. Oh, that's good. And I think it's even that, that helpful, like, like even the helpfulness of giving a narrative rather than a straight answer is something that Daniel represents really well. And that's really difficult. That's, that's not something that we tend to do. We tend to be like, well, you should give the straight answer as quickly as possible. And Daniel tells a story and it's way more effective than just the straight answer would have been. That's a really great observation. I, I hadn't really thought through that before that that is the first thing Daniel does is addresses him with a narrative. Cause that's so important to how even receivable that truth is yeah. that Belshazzar's lineage has lived through the exact same fault. Yeah. And you know how it ended really poorly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Dude was driven bad into the fields. I mean, we talked about this last week, but it's like, okay, humble. The humble life is really what God is after here. That's what we need to think about. And then you can move forward into the joy of the Lord. It's like, and if you can't be humble, it's not going to go well. Yeah. Yeah. And so maybe one other note on that is maybe we should start with our own stories. That's one other area we Mm. can meet the culture is rather than, um, starting with the propositions and saying, this is wrong. You need to do this. Um, which, I, I've known very little people whose minds have been changed by that. I mean, they're they're out there for sure. Some people, sure. truth in the right moment and the right way is what they need to hear. However, I think what connects to people is narrative, and it is maybe our narrative. We start where, oh, that's an interesting. That's interesting that that's how you identify yourself. It's interesting that that's the lifestyle you're living. Can I tell you a little bit about mm. what's changed my life the most and what is actually integral to who I am? Yeah. Let me tell you my story and start there. And I love that. Even, uh, that just reminds me one of the Sunday school classes that's coming up this summer is going to be on confident witness. Um, Paul Peterson, he's the campus director of the navigators at CU. He's going to be teaching that class. And I remember one of the things I learned first about sharing the gospel with non-believers from Paul back when I was in college in 2013 one of the first ways he taught me how to share the gospel was actually by sharing my testimony. It's good. And it's like, Oh, that because practically that has been so helpful throughout history to be able to share your own story with someone about how the gospel has changed your life and then be able to share the gospel powerfully with them. Yeah. It doesn't mean you have to have this crazy story of who you were and who you are now, but simply talk about what God is doing right now. In your life, any anyone who's been walking with the Lord faithfully, they, they can do that. They can talk about, well, this is how I've seen God change things for me, and just the things He's taught me about who I am and who He is and who His Son is. And uh, I would love to share with that that with you. You know, that's it. It doesn't uh, have to be this uh, intro plot conclusion kind of amazing story. Yeah, because because most people's stories aren't finished. And so they don't look like that. Yep. (laughs) (laughs) And that's okay. And now I am who I am today. Yeah, Uh, I'm at the end. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So untrue for so many of us. I hope it's not true for me. That would be. Yeah. Sad finish. It'd be a great story regardless. (laughs) (laughs) Jake, I've just been delighted to be able to have you on again this week. It's been so fun to just talk more about Daniel and life and our culture that God has us living in. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thanks so much for being here. And as always, thanks for listening to the weekly. We're so grateful you're here. And uh, if you have questions, thoughts, please shoot them on over. We would love to hear from you and we'll see you next week here on the weekly.